So in the last lesson, we talked pretty extensively about the rate of a reaction. And now we're going to be talking about rate laws. Now, the purpose of a rate law is to actually show you how the rate depends on the reactant concentration, right? So if I increase the concentration of a specific reactant, how is that going to affect the rate of the reaction? That's what a rate law allows you to determine. So if I show you this generic reaction right here, this is an example of a rate law. So rate equals K, which is your rate constant, which I'll talk about in a little bit, times your concentration of A raised to the M times B raised to the N. So M and N, we call those the order. So if A is first order, then that M would be a one. If A is second order, that M would be a two. If it's third order, M would be a three, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason why you see a lot of letters here, the reason why is because we want to make it very clear that those values, your coefficients for this reaction, the little a and the little b, do not correspond to the order for a specific reactant. The exponents themselves, the only way to determine them is actually experimentally and not simply by stoichiometry, which is what you would do if you would assume that the exponent, that m, would just be that little a, right? So if it were 2 capital A plus 2 capital B, that does not mean that the exponent for m and n would be 2 as well, okay? And so don't ever use the reaction itself in order to determine the order. Instead, we have to do it experimentally, which I'll show you how to do in a little bit, okay? So let's actually look at an example of a rate law and see how we can use it in order to determine how concentration affects rate. So for the first one here, if A doubles, notice for this rate law that A is first order. So what exactly does that mean? Well, whatever happens to the concentration of A, it doubles here. You're going to raise that to the first power because it's first order, and that's what's going to happen to your rate. So in this case, it's going to be 2 raised to the 1, so your rate is going to double. What about for B? Well, if B doubles, that's going to be 2 raised to the 2, and in that case, your rate is going to quadruple. What if B triples? Well, that's going to be 3 raised to the 2. That's going to give you 9, so the rate's going to increase by a factor of 9. Okay. What if C doubles? If C doubles, then that's going to be 2 raised to the third because it's third order, and so your rate is going to increase by a factor of eight. If C triples, that's going to be three raised to the third, so that's going to increase by a factor of 27. Okay. What if A stays the same, right? If A doesn't change at all, well, that would be one raised to the first. Your rate is not going to change. It's going to stay the same. All right. Now, if I'm asking you about D, right, I have a fourth reactant here. It is D. Notice it does not show up in your rate law. Okay. Well, if D doubles, then your rate's going to stay the same since that does not show up in your rate law, which tells us that if D does not show up in the rate law, D is what we say to be zero order. Zero order means if a reactant is zero order, that means a change in its concentration is not going to affect the rate of that reaction at all, and therefore we do not include it in your rate law. All right. Let's look at your rate constant, which is your K, all right? So if you look at this rate law example, rate equals K times your concentration of A times your concentration of B, it makes sense that the larger your K, the faster your reaction rate is going to be, right? While the smaller your K, the slower your reaction rate is going to be since they are clearly directly related. When K goes up, your rate goes up. When K goes down, your rate goes down. Now, the only thing that actually affects your K is going to be temperature changes, okay? You can change concentration, you can change pressure, you can change whatever you want to change. Nothing is going to change K except for changing temperature, okay? And it makes sense that when you increase temperature, since your rate increases when you increase temperature, remember, because you have more collisions and you have more collisions with su sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy. Since your rate increases when you increase temperature, it makes sense that your K would also increase. All right, so that's your rate constant itself. We're going to look at it a little bit in more detail with respect to units now. Okay, so when we're looking at an overall reaction, let's say, for example, this rate law overall. Okay, so 
I know that A is first order because A is raised to the first. I know that B is second order because it is raised to the second. The overall reaction order here is three. Now the reason why that is important is it actually helps us to determine the units for K, which is something that you are, off, you are definitely going to be asked about at some point on the AP. So what are my units for K for this specific rate law? Well, if my units for rate, let's say for example, are molar per second, okay? Since my overall reaction order is three, the reason why that's important is because you will take the molar from A, the molar squared from B, because remember the units for concentration are molar, the overall units for the right hand side are gonna be molar cubed because the overall reaction order is third, okay? So how in the world can I get molar per second if I start off with molar cubed? Well, remember from basic algebra, if you are multiplying your bases, you will add your exponents. So molar cubed times molar to the what would give you just molar to the first power, or well, molar to the negative two. So molar cubed times molar to the negative two would give you simply molar, which is what I want. But I also want seconds, so, and I want seconds in the denominator. So this would be molar to the negative two, seconds to the negative one, and those are my units for my k. Let's look at another example. If I give you rate equals k times my concentration of A, the overall reaction order here, since I only have A, is going to be first order. Okay? Let's say, for example, my units for my rate are molar per hour. Okay? My units for my right-hand side, since this is only first order overall, are going to be simply be molar. So notice I don't have to do anything to the molars because they're already the same on both sides, so I'm going to leave that alone, and I simply need to multiply by hours to the negative one in order to get into molar per hour for my rate. So my units for my k here are going to be hours to the negative one. Let's look at another example. Here I've got A for is first order, B is second order, and C is third order. So the overall reaction order here is going to be to the sixth, right? It's going to be sixth order. So let's say, for example, I want my rate to be molar per minute. Okay? And since my overall reaction order is six, my right-hand side is going to be give me molar to the sixth. So in order to get molar per minute, my units for my K are going to be molar to the negative fifth here, because molar to the negative fifth times molar to the sixth would just be molar minutes to the negative one. All right? So let's look at an example of how to use experimental data in order to determine the order of a reaction. So here it tells me that doubling the concentration of ClO minus quadruples the initial rate of formation of ClO3 minus. What is the rate law for this reaction? Okay, so my Remember, it's rate equals K times your concentration of ClO minus raised to the I don't know what. But if my rate is quadrupling and my concentration of my, uh, of my reactant is doubling, I can write this like this. Four is the change in my rate. Two is the change in my concentration. So two raised to the what, that's my order, the what is my order, equals four. Well, two. So that tells me that my order is going to be second order with respect to ClO minus. So if I wrote this rate law, I would write it as rate equals K times my concentration of ClO minus squared since it's second order for ClO minus. Okay. Next it asks what are the units for my rate constant? Well, since it's second order, that means on my right hand side my units are going to be molar squared while my units for my rate are molar per minute, which means that my units for my k need to be molar to the negative one, minutes to the negative one. Okay. All right, so let's combine all of this knowledge together and actually look at a slightly more complex version of what we just did. So how do I determine my rate law if I simply am given a bunch of different concentrations and the rates given those concentrations? Okay. So let's look at this example. So this data was collected. So notice I've got a concentration for one of my reactants and for my second reactant and the rate. Then if we change the concentrations, I see how that would affect the rate for the next one. If I change the concentration again, I get another rate. So I'm going to be taking all of this information and determining the order for my reactants. 
just like what we did in the previous problem where I said, okay, if my concentration of one of my reactants doubles while my rate quadruples, what order would that be? Well, it's second order. Now we're just going to do it on a larger scale, okay? So if we look at this, I first want to determine the order for SO2. So I need to see which trial I can use so that my concentration of SO2 is changing, but my concentration of O3 is not. Because in order to determine how the concentration of SO2 affects my rate, I want to make sure my concentration of O3 has nothing to do with it. I want it completely separate. So I can use trial 2 and trial 3, the, the second and the third data that was collected. So if you, look, if you look from trial 2 to trial 3, my concentration of SO2 triples. It goes from 0.25 to 0.75. My initial rate goes from 0.118 to 1.062. So basic math tells you that's going to be right around 10, right? And since my concentration of SO2 is tripling, I'm guessing my rate change is going to be increasing by a factor of 9. So I'm going to write this as 3 raised to the what equals 9. Since my concentration of SO2 is tripling, my rate is increasing by a factor of 9, what would my order for SO2 be? Well, it would have to be second order since 3 squared is 9. So that is my order for SO2. It's second order. Let's look at O3. All right, what two trials can I use here? Well, I want my concentration of SO2 to be stay the same, so I'm going to use trial 1 and trial 2. And I'm specifically going to go from trial 2 to trial 1 since O3's concentration is doubling from trial 2 to trial 1, from 0.2 to 0.4. Okay, so here's my concentration of O3 raised to the whatever power it is equals my rate. Well, when I go from trial 2 to trial 3, my concentration of O3 doubles. Keeping in mind my concentration of SO2 is staying the same. That's why I'm using trial 2 and trial 1. So O3 is doubling. My rate actually stays the same. So it's going to be 2 to the x equals 1. Well, what 2 raised to the what would give you 1? Well, 0. So O3 is actually zero order, which makes sense. Because by the definition of a zero order reactant, changing its concentration has no impact on the rate itself. So if I were to write out my rate law here, it would be rate equals my k times my concentration of SO2 squared. Since, at, since O3 is zero order, I don't include it in the rate law. Okay. Next it says determine the value and the units for the rate constant. So we had just talked about rate constant units. Let's actually look at how to determine the rate, the rate constant itself. So I can use whatever trial I want to use. So let's use, for example, let's use the first trial. So I know that my initial rate is 0.118, and I know that my initial concentration of SO2 is 0.25. So I'm going to plug that in, and I can solve for my K by simply taking 0.118 and dividing by 0.25 squared. Before I show you the answer, I want to really quickly talk about the units for K. Since my overall order is second order, that means that the units on the right-hand side are going to be molar squared, which means the unit for my rate is going to be molar per second. Notice in the table here it shows moles over liter times seconds. Remember, moles over liters is simply molar. So that's another way of just writing molar per second. So my rate is molar per second. My units on the right-hand side are molar squared which means I need for my units for K molar to the negative one in order to get rid of the molar squared and then seconds to the negative one. So my K, once I calculate it, is gonna be 1.9 molar to the negative one, seconds to the negative one. All right, so notice for this problem, it was different from the previous problem because I now have to figure out which trial to use so that one of my reactants concentration stays the same so then I can determine how the change in the other's concentration affects the rate. Before I just give you one simple reactant and you figured it out. Well, here comes the next challenging part. What if I don't keep one of the concentrations the same? Okay. So if you look at this data here, I immediately know I'm in trouble because if you look at the concentration of A, it never stays the same. 
So how the heck am I going to determine the constant, the order of B, right? Because I need A to stay the same based on what we just talked about. Well, we'll get to it. Don't freak out. Let's first determine the order of A. So I'm going to use experiment one and experiment two. Before I do that, a lot of the time for these problems, you're going to be limited time-wise. So plugging in your rates into a calculator is going to be kind of a waste of time. Or you could potentially not have a calculator because you might be doing a multiple choice problem. So if you're given these kind of scary looking exponents like you see on the right hand side for your rates, 4.3 times 10 to the negative fourth, 1.3 times 10 to the negative third, etc., here's a really nice trick. Okay? Find the smallest exponent, so here it's 10 to the negative fourth, and then you're gonna multiply all of the rates by 10 to the positive value of that value. So instead of 10 to the negative fourth, you're gonna multiply all of them by 10 to the fourth. The reason why you do that, it gets rid of all your exponents. So now you suddenly have 4.3. For the next one, 1.3 1 times 10 to the negative third, if you multiply that by 10 to the fourth, the 10 to the negative third is simply gonna become 10, because 10 to the negative third times 10 to the fourth is simply 10. So 1.3 times 10 to the first, or 10, is simply 13. So now instead of these exponents, I have 4.3, 13, 53, and 80, which makes it a lot easier to determine how it's changing without having to use your calculator. So I'm gonna use experiment one and experiment two in order to determine the order of A first. So right now, here's what I have. I know that my rate equals K times my concentration of A raised to the, I don't know, because I don't know the order, times my concentration of B raised to the, I don't know, because I don't know the order. I'm first determining the order of A, so I'm gonna use experiment one, experiment two. Okay, so if from experiment one to experiment two, the concentration of A triples, the rate I see increases by, it triples as well, okay? So since my rate is tripling, my rate is three, my concentration of A increases by a factor of three. That means three raised to the what is three? One, so I know that my order for A is gonna be first order. Now comes the question of what the heck do I do since my concentration of A never stays the same? Well, I can simply plug it into my rate law in order to figure out the order of B. So let's find two trials in which both A and B change. So let's use number two, experiment two, and experiment three. So since I know the order of A is one now, I can get rid of the X, and now I'm gonna plug in all of the information that I know. So I know that my rate increases by a factor of four. It's going from 13 to 53, so that the rate is four. A goes from 0.75 to 1.5, so it increases by a factor of two, so it's gonna be a two for A. And B goes from 0.75 to 1.5, so it's gonna increase by two as well. So this is what I've got here, all right? So given that information, four equals two times two raised to the what, that what is gonna be one. What if, for example, instead my rate increased by a factor of eight? If my rate increased by a factor of eight there, then I know two times two to the what would give me eight? Well, it would have to be two squared, so my order there would then be two, since two times two squared is eight, all right? So, the previous problem, I, for each of the reactants, there were trials that I could use where they stay the same, if that doesn't occur, simply plug it in. Figure out the order for one of the one that you're able to, and then you can actually plug it in to determine the order of the other, like I just showed you, okay? All right, so now I need to actually explain this, because a lot of the time they'll, actually, they'll ask you to explain how you determined the order. So for A, when A triples from experiment one to experiment three, the rate also triples. Therefore, A is first order. That's all you need to say. For B, when A doubles from experiment two to experiment three, B doubles while the rate quadruples. Since A is first order, B must also be first order. So notice I'm taking the math that you just did and I'm just explaining it in words. That's all they want you to do. So the rate law for this is gonna be rate equals K times your concentration of A times your concentration of B. Okay. All right, determine the initial rate of change of A in experiment three. So if you look for experiment three, it actually gives you the initial rate of formation of C. So we've got to go back to the previous lesson and remember 
that when I'm comparing the rates, I can use the stoichiometry of the reaction. So if you look at the reaction up above, that tells me that negative one half the rate of A equals negative the rate of B, which equals the rate of C, which equals the rate of D. So if I'm comparing the rate of A and the rate of C, it would be negative one half the rate of A equals the rate of C. Since I know the rate of C is 5.3 times 10 to the negative third, I can actually simply just solve this. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by negative two, and I get my rate of A is gonna be negative 1.1 times 10 to the negative second molar per second. Now it makes sense that your rate for this would be negative since it's a reactant, it's gonna be disappearing, so the rate should be negative, all right? Last part of this, determine the initial value of B in this experiment, okay, in, in experiment four. So rate equals K times my concentration of A times my concentration of B, that's what we got up above. Now, in the, for the experiment four, I know my rate and I know my A. The issue is I don't know my K and I don't know my B. So the first thing I need to do is I need to determine my B. To do that, I can use any of the other three experiments. So I'm gonna use experiment one here. I plug in my rate, I plug in my concentration of A and my concentration of B, and I can solve for K. So my K, I simply need to divide. Keep in mind that the overall order for this is two, it's second order, so the units on the right-hand side are gonna be molar squared, while my units for rate are molar per second. So my units for K are going to be molar to the negative 1 seconds to the negative 1, and that's my K value right there. So that's great. I've got my K value, but I haven't answered the question. What is the initial concentration of B? Well, I know my rate for experiment 4. I now know my K, and I know my A value. Plug those all in. Divide in order to isolate B, and you get 2.0 molar for your concentration of B. So just as a quick review, your rate law, what is the purpose of it? It allows you to see how changes in concentration of your reactants will affect the rate. You have your K, that is your rate constant. Okay, so your rate constant, remember the, one of the major issues that people have with it is simply determining units. That's why I kind of beat, beat like a dead horse trying to explain how to determine the, um, the units for your rate constant. Remember the only thing that can change the value of your rate constant ever is gonna be temperature. So if you didn't notice, for if you took all of these different experiments we looked at and calculated your K, it's going to be the same for all of them. Regardless, because the only thing you're changing is concentration, you're not changing time. Okay. Then remember that when you are given different trials, if one reactant concentration stays the same, then you would look at those trials in order to determine how changes in concentration of your other reactant would affect rate in order to determine the order. And then, for the final example that we just went through, if one of the reactants never stays the same, then you need to plug in all of your values into your rate law in order to determine the order for your unknown. Okay, so I would strongly recommend going back and re-watching this video just to make sure you truly understand everything.